My name is Erin Meyer. I'm the Sustainable Food Programs Coordinator at the University of California, Merced. Happy World Food Day to everyone. Um, we started a series, a uh, sustainable movie series, uh, which film, or showed a couple of different films like Growing Solutions. Um, we had a panel discussion with a uh, documentarian about COVID and so on. And so next we wanted to reach out to Jen about her fantastic documentary called Just Eat It. Um, my interns have raved about it so much so we made it part of our training. Um, I coordinate a food rescue program and they were so inspired by it and I continue to be inspired by it every time I rewatch it a million times. Um, so that's a little bit about me and uh, Alicia, would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Hi, my name is Alicia. I'm a philosophy and political science major. I work with Erin in the sustainable foods program and um, that's pretty much about me other than the fact that I am a, a food intern, so I do some food rescues with her and it's it's a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. Jen, um, probably the most important intro. Would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, you might be muted. I'm muted. Uh, I'm the producer of the film, Just Eat It. Um, I'm also a subject because sometimes people are like, how do you get access to those people? And I'm like, no, no, we are those people. <laughs> we had unlimited access. Um, Grant is my partner in work and in life. Um, we work full time in film now, um, which kind of happened after Just Eat It. I'm happy to talk about that more. Um, but my original career was I was a GIS analyst. I was a geographer uh, for about a decade. And so that was my day job during the filming of Just Eat It. When you see me working at my desk, um, that's what I was doing, making maps. And then I started moving more into marketing. And then we made this documentary, which was our second documentary. And that was the way that I was able to kind of shift my entire life into film. So now I work in film full time. So you never know where your career path is gonna go. Awesome. And I looked into some of your other document documentaries and I'm excited to watch them. Um, so let's begin. We're just going to go through some questions. If anyone has questions too, we would welcome them. Um, maybe just put them in chat if you want. Um, instead of just, you know, shouting them out, we'll keep it a little civil. So yeah, just throw them into chat if you would like. And we will begin. Alicia, feel free and get started. Yes. So the first question is concerning evangelical outreach programs and what they might do to mitigate food waste, whether that's talking to local officials or actually talking to the food supply chains in themselves and whether composing letters on this would be advisable. And if so, are there any templates available? Uh, so, yes, I think letter writing always makes a difference. I heard one time that when politicians receive a letter, they assume that there's at least another hundred people that support that opinion, but just didn't take the time to write a letter. So it is really meaningful and they do read them. Um, I don't have any templates. However, I'm part of a great uh, zero waste group. And so I've put that question out to the group. So if I receive a response with any kind of templates, I'll send them back. Um, but if people are writing letters, they definitely would like to cite um, the Good Samaritan legislation. Uh, on our website at foodwastemovie.com, if you go to resources, we have a link to legislation. Um, I'm in Canada, so we have Canadian, but we also have American legislation um, th that shows that people are allowed to donate. Um, and then there's also a few more resources there for organizations that are rescuing food if people want to get involved in a more hands-on manner. Absolutely. Thank you. That definitely answers that question and maybe even letters to the editor. Um, so the next question is, how have you continued to reduce uh, food waste after the film? Uh, so I, I don't dumpster dive the way I used to, although, I, you know, if I'm going past an area that I know will be good, I might pop by. Um, I've, I've gotten more involved in apps where people or businesses are sharing food. Um, there's a couple here where, you know, it'll be discounted you buy it in advance and then you go and there's a special fridge in the grocery store where you go and pick up your items and those are usually close dated um there's also some sharing apps like olio where it's literally people being like i have too much of this i just actually did it we had canadian thanksgiving last weekend and i, I did an online order for groceries and i got yams but i thought i was ordering like five regular size yams and they were like 
three pounds each. Like it was just too much yam. I had five of them. And so then I was able to put it out to my neighborhood and be like, hey, I have too many yams, who wants one? And someone came and picked them up, no problem. So um, a lot of like peer to peer sharing. Um, and then of course, composting. So at the time that we made the film, we didn't have municipal composting. So we were doing it in our backyard. Uh, I still do that, but now we also have an option for curbside pickup for meat and dairy and things like that. That helps a lot. Um, and of course, eating everything on our plate. We have a couple kids now, so yeah, they know the rules for sure. That helps, definitely. So I take it you've been able to get your hands on some feta lately. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> it's a luxury to buy whatever you want, whenever you want. And I do appreciate it. Like doing an extreme project like that kind of resets um, your appreciation level for what you actually do have. In regards to ugly food, what do you think this says about our society where in order for food to be distributed and eaten, it has to look a specific way? Yeah, I mean, it's it's reflective of so many things in our society, right? I mean, it's an Instagram society where everyone wants to look perfect and it extends even to our produce, which seems crazy. Um, I feel like the best way to combat that is, is at the grassroots level. Although mm. I do see some grocery stores jumping on board. I bought a bag of apples the other day and it said imperfect, like right on it. They were selling it as ugly fruit and vegetables. So that was kind of cool to see. And is that mainly what Quest stocked? Um, Quest has a variety of things. They have a lot of close dated items. Um, and then depending on the season, like I remember during tomato season, they would just have boxes and boxes of tomatoes. So whatever is in the local fields, for sure. I really like their model though, because it's, it's about allowing people to make choice, right? Like just because you're food insecure doesn't mean that you might not be gluten free or like have certain ethnic foods you like to eat. So they really give people a choice rather than just being like, here's the food for the week. That is so necessary. Have supermarkets, corporations, businesses or individuals reached out to you to help them personally in their food waste journey? Um, not so much businesses although I did have one business there's there's a, a brand of jam that appears in one of the dumpsters and they did reach out to us and we're like I can't believe our jam was in that dumpster and they didn't realize that that was happening like on the other side of the country with their wholesaler so they were able to have a conversation which was really cool to see um I I know of individuals lots of individuals um there was a guy who was a teacher and he's like I just quit my job and I started a food rescue nonprofit. And he was literally being that middleman, you know, picking up the food from the people who have it and getting it to the organizations that need it because a lot of it really is about logistics. You know, there's lots of kitchens that could use the food, but they don't have the time or resources to drive around the city picking it up. And so for him to be that consistent link made a big difference. And that, that nonprofit's been going for about five years now. So yeah, that's pretty cool to see. Like he literally was like, your documentary made me do that. So it was cool. That's excellent. And it's got to be very rewarding for you as well. How do you think we can change consumer behavior in reducing food waste? And does education and communication strategies have the answer? Yeah, uh, education helps, right? I mean, watching documentaries, learning things in school, that always helps. But I think the way that we really shift the whole society is to make it systemic. Like, when you go to the grocery store, it has to be so easy to make the right choice. And we need to have it so that only the good choices are available. So between the two kinds of apples you're gonna pick, like both of them have been ethically sourced, both of them have a variety of sizes in the mix um, so that you're like supporting the entire system, but without thinking about it. Because when people have to do too much research, they just can't wrap their head around it. I mean, there's so many issues. Food waste is just one of them. It's like climate change, is it electricity? Is it um, all these little things that people can do? And there's just not enough time for people to research them. So it has to be easy. Like I wanna go to the grocery store and know that those choices are all good choices for me. Absolutely. And so would you say that this choice is more than the consumer's choice, but it's actually the distributor's choice as well? Yeah, I mean, if you talk to distributors, they say that they're just distributing what people want. Um, right. I mean, people want convenience is what they really want, right? Like they want things to be pre-washed and bagged and convenient for lunches and things like that. And 
I don't know. I mean, sometimes regulators do need to step in and be like, look, this is nonsense. We need to have some rules around this. But Absolutely. yeah, but also sometimes it just takes one person. So in terms of donating, it's just one manager at the store that needs to be connected to one person who can pick up the produce or with the farms that we talked to, like it's just one person who's in control of deciding where their surplus food is going to be going. So, you know, it still is about individual connections as well. What do you think has been your most shocking experience in the production of this film? Mm, I, the scale, I'd never seen, I never really worked in the food industry. Like I worked as a cashier at a grocery store for a while, but never on the back end. Like I'd really never seen dumpsters full of food, especially when you see one kind of food that was excessively shocking. And then the second thing that I really didn't realize was about um, guaranteed sales. So things like dairy, especially when the distributor sends it to the store, they guarantee the sale. And if the store is not able to sell it, they're able to send it back for no penalty. So then there's really no incentive for them to really push that product or to put it on sale. They just send it back and they get a credit. And by the time the wholesaler gets it back, they can't do anything with it. What are you gonna do with milk that's close date? Nothing, you have to throw it out. So that, that system was surprising to me. And this is indubitably what contributed to the dumpster of hummus and uh, bananas as well, right? Yeah, exactly. The hummus, the, the hummus was close dated and it still had three weeks, I think, but by the time it got back, um, it was just not enough time for a wholesaler to do something with it. Um, that particular wholesaler, I have talked to them. They were donating Monday to Friday, but on Saturdays, there was no pickup. So that's when we were accessing their dumpster and it was always, it was always full. Um, and then with the chocolate bars, same thing, same, same organization actually. Uh, in Canada, things need to be labeled with French and English and there was no French on those chocolate bars. So it wasn't worth their while. They have to open the master case then open each box and take out each one and put stickers on. Um, I saw them doing it with some of them, but then at some point they were like, we don't have time to put this labor in to doing this and they, they checked the whole product. Well, I'm very happy that they were distributed to children on Halloween. That was wonderful. Oh, <laughs> we, ate, we ate chocolate literally for two years after that. Like, <laughs> it was ridiculous. Um, how do you believe the pandemic has affected food waste and insecurity? Uh, I mean, I can speak from personal experience. In some ways, uh, it's been good for our family because we've really been meal planning, especially at the very beginning. Like we were literally planning for 10 days and like choosing our meals and then only buying groceries for those 10 days. Um, so there was very little waste. Um, also, everybody's home. So we're all leaving leftovers for lunch rather than, you know, oh, I'm going to go out for lunch and leave whatever's in my fridge there to rot. Um, so Personally, we have less food waste, um, but systemically it's, it's a big problem, right? Like restaurants aren't buying things and for the producers that we're selling exclusively to restaurants, that's a really big deal. So yeah, I mean, it's hit the economy, but it's also hit the food chain. I think if you make certain kinds of food, like if you make pasta, you're probably doing awesome because you know everybody knows how to cook pasta. I know that their sales went way up during the pandemic because everyone's like, what can we cook at home? What do we all know how to do that's easy? Um, but for those more kind of gourmet items or things that take more preparation, maybe they're not doing as well. Have you experienced an encounter where someone told you that your film had a personal impact on them? Um, oh yeah, all the time, all the time. That's the best thing. I mean, that's not the reason we made the film, but um, after we made the film, we, we went to Hot Docs, which is the largest documentary film fest in North America. And then in Europe, IDFA is the largest documentary film fest in the world. And we were able to go to both of those. And we also went to CPH Docs, which is another big one. And everywhere we went, um, we met the most inspiring people. They set up panels with people that were engaged on the ground. Um, so it was really rewarding for us to be able to connect with people. And I literally have been, like we've been all over the world with this film. I've been to the Dom Dominican Republic and to Belgium and all through the States. Um, so, I mean, personally it's been, it's been exciting and rewarding, but also um, it's increased our ability to kind of catalyze change because when someone says, oh, do you know someone in, you know, Amsterdam that is working on food waste? And I'm like, yes, I do. I can connect you. So I feel like that's more of my role now, like rather than being right on the ground, 
um, I'm able to be the catalyst for change by connecting people. That's excellent. How might littering be unacceptable, whereas food waste is? Yeah, it, isn't that funny? I, I think because it's hidden, probably. I mean, littering is so obvious, whereas right. food waste, people are doing things in their houses and you just don't even realize that it goes on. Like, and still, until I made this film and we were talking so much about food waste, um, I didn't realize that some people don't eat leftovers. Like they don't eat them. They just throw the extra of their recipe in the garbage, right? And if you don't do that, you think it's crazy. But if you were raised like that, you think it's completely normal. Um, and why would you even have that conversation with someone unless you, you know, see a documentary like ours that kind of sparks that initial discussion. So, I mean, that that's our goal for sure is to kind of shift the, the popular culture or the idea of what is acceptable in society. I think we definitely need to shift that paradigm, especially because we have legislation that curtails littering, but we don't have that for food waste, at least to my knowledge. Is that correct? Um, well, in my region, you really do have to compost. Um, the legislation is there that you're not allowed to put food waste in the garbage. However, um, when it comes to actually checking on people and uh -oh. administering fines and things like that, I don't know. Like, I haven't actually heard of anybody ever getting fined. And it's really at the garbage truck level. Like, when the garbage truck pulls up, if it has more than 10% food waste in it, they may get a fine. But then someone has to actually check it. So, I mean, it's growing. It's growing. But in general, across North America, it's not there yet at all. Yeah, I wonder how we would be able to get there in the first place. That's very interesting. Yeah, definitely um, maybe drafting some letters to legislatures as well. Um, yeah. There was a point where you entered a grocery store to, to get milk for your family. How long had it been since you were in a grocery store prior to that occasion? Um, I don't remember exactly, but I do remember when we did that, we were visiting Grant's mom and she wanted milk, so we bought her some milk. Um, but during the entire project, I mean, we rarely went right into the grocery stores. Once we built up enough stock, I think the first few weeks were probably the hardest. Um, or if you'd find a bunch of one thing, like you'd find a bunch of milk, but you had nothing to do with it. And then later on, you'd find a bunch of cereal. So as we were able to stockpile, we had more of a pantry that we could pull from. Um, we live in kind of a tiny house. We don't actually have a pantry. It was like <laughs> under our beds and things like that. But um, yeah, it, it was a luxury to go back into the grocery store afterwards, for sure. And to like buy what we liked. I really, I still appreciate it. How did you get them to say yes to purchasing the cold food in the department store? Oh, I always try to pick like the youngest stock boy I can because they're usually they're the most obedient. <laughs> and they're like, yes, ma'am, I'll go and get what you want. <laughs> ha -ha <Wisdom>. Yeah. <laughs> so um, Nick, I believe your brother-in-law likened grocery lists as a chore where you have to take inventory of everything that's in the fridge. You have to go through the pantry, take everything inventory of that, and then you have to compile what you need from the grocery store. And is there anything that we can reduce this chore for individuals who might share his sentiments? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, we kind of threw him under the bus a bit, but he also is a super foodie. Like he, he spends time researching what recipes he wants to make and day to day, they may have nothing to do with each other. Whereas I'm more like, I'm gonna make this this day and then I can use the leftovers to make this next thing. Um, but I also think he's like, perfectly average like lots of people do that and he is an excellent chef so he has lots of ingredients like if you need if he needs the cilantro he's going to get the cilantro he's not going to like have some kind of substitute that he pulls out of his fridge he needs the exact ingredients for his recipes um there are a few apps now where you can like type in the things that you have in your fridge and it will generate a recipe for you from its database which is kind of cool um i also i use a, an app called meal lime where it you pick your recipes and then it makes your grocery list for you. And then you just check off the things you already have. And so I think that's easy because it's it's digital and I can just look at my fridge real quick and be like, yeah, yeah, I have carrots, I have mayo, I have whatever. And then whatever's left is what I have to buy. Um, so that's helped our, our family a lot. So you also said that there was an app where you could insert all of the items that you have on hand and then get a yes. recipe generated from yeah. that? Yeah, and I can't remember the name of it right now, but... Um, I feel like I saw it through love, food, hate, waste. 
Okay. Um, and I can try to look it up afterwards for you if you can't find I it. I think but... this would benefit everyone. Yeah. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Um, so was there any discomfort shopping from Nick and Linda's fridge? And is this something you would encourage others interested in mitigating food waste to do as well? I mean, no, not really, because <laughs> they're old, like they're the older brother, right? So we're kind of like the dirtbag younger sibling. So we've oh. always been like, like that. And I don't have a problem with, with taking hand-me-downs or, or somebody else's food for sure. But also because we were doing the film project, it kind of gave me a little bit more confidence. I mean, I, I probably wouldn't do with anybody else except for family. Yeah. Um, but the more you talk about it, the more you're public, like, look, I'm doing this project, then people can get on board. If you, if they think that you're just randomly deciding to change your ideals, it's, it's harder for them to get behind. But when you're like, look, this is the exact project I'm doing and I'm doing it for one month, like then people can get behind it and support it. So that's why we like doing it for a set amount of time. That's a great idea. <laughs> Um, food banks do not have sufficient capacity to accept all the quantities of food waste at the market levels. What can the community do to reach out and distribute this food on their own to those in need? Um, I mean, I, I would really support getting behind the organizations that already exist because I feel like they do have the infrastructure um, and they have the scale where they can really make the best use of money and resources. Um, if you want to get in there and get your hands dirty, then, you know, joining an organization like the Food Recovery Network or which is campus on campuses across the states um, or your local food pantry, like they always need volunteers, always. And it's, it's a really rewarding way to get involved. I also really like gleaning. I've done a lot of gleaning in our local area. Um, we have casual gleaning in the fields, but we also have an organization called the Fruit Tree Project and they go um, into people's backyards. If you have like a big plum tree and you can't harvest it all, you call them and they send volunteers to pick your plums and then they give one third to the volunteers, one third to the tree owner and one third to a nonprofit and they just drop it off at the end. Um, so, I mean, there's so many organizations like that. Um, you should check the, the food waste database of organizations because I'm sure there's something close to where you live that does a similar thing. That sounds great. And I wonder if they're still operative considering COVID, but that's going to be interesting to, to find out for ourselves. Yeah, I mean, people still need food. So a lot of them are essential services. I know for the Fruit Tree Project, they were trying to just put people in pods of three so that they were always working together rather than having random volunteers gathering. Yeah. Very smart. So there is a growing movement since the pandemic to open community fridges as a solution to food waste and, and food insecurity. There was a recent Civil Eats article indicating that they are not a good solution to addressing hunger. Are you familiar with the movement and do you think it is an effective solution? I haven't read the article, so maybe I'm going to put my foot in my mouth here. Um, I don't think it's a solution to hunger, but I think it's a band-aid that is a part of the puzzle. So I really like when people are able to rescue food and share with people rather than saying, we're taking this food and now we're giving it to people who are low income. I don't really feel like that is the way that it has to be in society. I mean, food is food and I feel like anybody should eat. So I really support programs where they're like, we're having a community meal and it doesn't matter if you're low income or high income, like come and enjoy this food with us or come and access this food because it makes it more of an equalizer. Um, in our area, we have buy nothing groups where people offer services or food or whatever. And like, that's the whole point of it is that you, that you're offering and anybody can accept. Um, and it, it reduces the stigma for people who really need to access those things. So, I mean, I like the idea of those. I like the idea of like little libraries where people put books on their, on their corner or boxes of free things or any of that stuff. I think it builds community. Absolutely. Do you still have an eat me first bin? Yes, we do. Um, and our local organization, our local like regional district actually like really got on that campaign. They have stickers that say eat me first and distributed to everybody. And yeah, that was kind of cool. 
Um, so I do, I really try to prioritize putting my leftovers into like glass containers so that I can see what's in them. And I put the date on them. Cause if I don't put the date on them, then I'm always like, even if it's in the eat me first, then I take it out and I'm like, when did we eat this? Like, I, I just can't remember. And then I'm unsure if it's safe to eat. So I'm pretty good at having a glass jar. And then I just write with like a whiteboard marker on it, that the date that I put it in there. How long are individuals able to keep their their stored foods, especially mm. like their leftovers. Is there any rule of thumb? Yeah, it depends on what it is, but like most leftovers, like three, four or five days, you're totally fine. Yeah. I'm gonna have to start writing on some glass containers. Yeah. <laughs> um, local food may be fresher and thus last longer. Cooking at home may help folks eat better. Did this challenge create long-term healthier and or more sustainable eating habits for you like eating more local and seasonal produce um it i don't think this particular project changed my views on that because i was kind of already on that bandwagon and actually during our project because we were just taking whatever we could get we actually had slightly less local produce um we did get some from some local farmers, but in general, like I would usually have a CSA box where a, a local farmer is just like selecting what they have um, and putting it in the box and delivering it weekly. So um, it was kind of a relief to get back to eating more local uh, and to growing more in our own garden. Like we're, we're lucky that we have a bit of a yard, so we're able to do that as well. And do your kids also participate in helping? Oh yeah, they're all, they're all over it. Like they'll eat anything from the garden, like spinach, kale, whatever. If I buy it at the store, they have none of it. But if they're like actually <laughs> taking it out of the garden, they're super into it. So yeah, it's great. And and my son's school has a really great garden. So um, we volunteer there as well. And they have an apple tree. We just pressed apple cider yesterday, actually. That sounds delicious. <laughs> this isn't the first film about food waste. Jeremy Seifert did a similar film. What's different about this film and how can it make a difference? Um, you're right. It, it's a similar genre. I think we probably started our project and like didn't even know about his film. But of course, during the course of making it, uh, we found out. I think there's always room for an update. Um, so even now, like there's more food waste films coming out, like that's great. People want the most current information or a new perspective, or maybe uh, one of the subjects in the film will be something that really resonates with a certain person in the audience. Uh, you never know exactly what message is gonna, is gonna hit with people. I feel like our film did a pretty good job of having the range of large scale systemic issues. And then also like what you can do as an individual, we try to make it, it pretty fun, but I mean, they're complimentary projects for sure. Absolutely. I remember that your partner was discussing, um, I believe it was his grandfather who would reuse the same tea bag over and over and over again. And that's definitely something that has made me question my own actions in my life, whereas, Am I doing something that's morally neutral if I'm just throwing away those tea bags instead of reusing them? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you can go so deep on, on any <laughs> little thing, right? Like, um, especially because our previous film was on like waste reduction. So then I think of tea bags, and I'm like, oh, and did you know that some tea bags have plastic in them and you're not even supposed to use them? Like, yeah, it could go on and on. <laughs> Since the release of the film, how do you think the issue of food waste has gotten better? or worse? Uh, I think our film hit at really like a, a great time when the public was ready for that message. So in the two years after the film was released, um, so it, it played on MSNBC in the States at, in a primetime slot, which was excellent. They had like a big kind of like red carpet event with Tom Colicchio talking about food waste, which was cool. Um, and then right around that time, it ended up being on like the Daily Show, like not our film, but the topic of food waste, like the Daily Show, like Tyra Banks did a thing on like ugly fruit and veg. It was really hitting the mainstream. It was on the cover of National Geographic, which is great. Like, I think people know, like people know that it's a thing, but like, are they swayed enough to change is the question. Um, I think now it's, it's generally out in the public more. There's been more campaigns around it. Um, I've just seen better education. It hasn't obviously stopped the issue, but um, education is just 
part of it. There's lots more work to do, but it, at least now when I say food waste, people are like, what are you talking about? And people are like, oh yeah, yeah, it's a problem. <laughs> Definitely. I know that um, the film illustrated that every time the average household goes to the store and they come out with four grocery bags, essentially they lose one. I think that was a great way to highlight that problem. Um, how much of it, let me see. How would you encourage someone to refrain from purchasing food more than needed? It's so hard at a personal level, right? Because people want people want to have enough. They don't want to run out of food and they want to be good hosts. Um, I like to have extra food in my house as well, but I try to buy it so it can be in my pantry, I guess, so that I'm more careful with the perishable foods that won't last as long. Um, sometimes you can just say things up front, you know, like once people knew I was interested in food waste, when I would go to their house for dinner or something, I'd be like, what are you doing with the leftovers? Like, if you don't have a plan, I'll help you make a plan. I have a Tupperware in my bag right now. If you, you know, like the more that you talk about it, or I go to an event and I'd say, Hey, like, do you have a donation plan for the food in the buffet afterwards? Or, um, so yeah, it, it's just about talking about it for sure. I see we have some questions in the group chat. Did you happen to find out the scale of learning programs either in your local area, agricultural community, or in Canada or in North America generally? About gleaning programs? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there's gleaning programs everywhere. So in the film, we went with Society of St. Andrews, which is in many of the states. Um, here we have a couple of other organizations, but we've definitely been gleaning uh, a few times and mostly out in the valley. So it's about two hours from where I live. So it's a little bit of a trek. You have to really want to do it. Um, so I've been focusing more on the urban one, like the, the fruit tree project style of gleaning. And you said that there's a directory that we can go on to figure out whether we have local gleaning programs in our community. Yeah, and I think I'm just going to look it up, but I think um, I, it's on our website. Please. Food Waste Movie .com, under resources. Um, there is a food waste directory that, I mean, we don't host it but I'm gonna find it. <laughs> okay, yeah, there's lots of great resources on there. Um, and foodwaste.org uh, has some good links. And then there's an ugly fruit and vegetable supermarket directory that's through endfoodwaste.org. And there's also uh, the Food Rescue Database, which has organizations all across the states. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you're interested in gleaning, those are your resources. <laughs> How much of the surplus food that Jen and Grant collected uh, expired or were not eaten on time? Mm, that's a good, yeah, that's a good question. We definitely had some waste. I mean, I started getting smarter. Um, and I would taste things while we were at the location where we were getting the food to see if they'd gone off. Because a lot of those products, like especially the natural products, if they were like chips with flaxseed in them, then flax goes off. So if it's close to the date, it just, it doesn't taste good anymore. Uh, none of that stuff's gonna actually like hurt you, but it tastes bad. So yeah, originally we'd be like, take it all, take it all. And then, and then I started getting smart and being like, I'm gonna taste this and see if I actually even like it. Cause you know, just because it's free doesn't mean that you actually like whatever that flavor of yogurt. So uh, we started being better about what we were taking. I wish that we'd shared a little bit more with friends. Like we did share with friends, but we should have had more dinners like we did at the end where we had all our friends come. We That was the only time we did that during the year. And I wish that I'd done it more, especially now that it's COVID and you can't do that stuff. I'm like, oh, I wish we had more friend dinners. Do you think that they would have hesitated to that idea? No, no, people love to have food. Yeah, if it's already prepared, people love food. We've done several uh, food rescue dinners, um, like partnering with chefs and as a fundraiser and it's all rescued food and they do these like amazing platings and um, people love it. And nobody even bats an eye at the food at all. We did a, a Feeding the 5000 event. So that's uh, an idea started by Tristan Stewart, who's in our film, 
where you do a public event and you feed 5,000 people with rescued food to draw attention to the issue. Um, so we did the first one in Canada here in Vancouver and worked um, a culinary school. And so usually they do like soups and stews and things that are easy to like feed a bunch of people. Um, but we didn't want to use bowls or anything like that. So we did all hand food and we did like little mini burgers and um, all this like beautiful tapas and we fed 5,000 servings to people and like not a single person was like, I don't know if this looks good to eat because it was clearly <laughs> delicious. That's excellent. And it just talks about our misconceptions as well. So I see that there's another question in the chat. It's from Jacqueline Tejada. I hope I'm saying that incorrectly. She says, a new nonprofit organization that I'm participating with is seeking to reduce food insecurity in our community by implementing hydroponic systems. Do you believe these programs are effective in encouraging people to grow their own food and volunteer at community gardens? Or does it contribute more to food waste if there is a lack of excess? Hmm, I mean, I also think it depends on where you live, right? Because, you know, some places water is more of a scarce resource than in other places. In some places, it's really easy to grow things outside. Um, but in some places, it's not. I think in general, anything that's encouraging people to grow their own food and to celebrate food is like a thumbs up for me, for sure. Excellent. Yeah, Jacqueline, I think you're doing a great thing. Further into the food waste challenge, Grant declared, I'm starting to enjoy this, particularly when he was dumpster diving. What do you think was his turning point? Oh, like just the variety of food. And <laughs> we ended up finding like a few really nice providers that was the type of food that we would normally buy, you know, like crackers that are, you know, seven, eight, nine dollars. Like that was beyond what we were usually buying at the grocery store. So we kind of got to have all this extra fancy stuff. Um, and the other thing was that we just kind of come off our previous film, which was about zero waste. Um, and so we we're really living packaging free. And so there are a lot of foods that we kind of denied ourselves for quite a while, um, like anything in a package. Um, so that was, that was pretty exciting for us. What made you want to do these supererogatory acts where, where you're not necessarily required to morally, but you had this inclination to do so? What, you mean like doing the the competition kind of thing absolutely uh I, originally it was just for fun like we <laughs> our whole idea of doing like a, a competition or a, a project came with our first project that was about living zero waste and we had just done a big cycle trip we cycled all the way from canada to mexico and we're like this is a challenge what can be our next challenge um and so it came, it came naturally for us. We just did it for fun. We did it on the weekend and in our spare time and we both had regular jobs. Like we made the movie for our friends and family in our basement. And then that one did well enough that we were able to get some funding to do this one. So we had a little bit more budget. We were able to, you know, like rent a slow motion camera and, you know, use a drone to get those aerial shots. But it was still like, it was a, still a DIY project. Like Grant's like, I want to figure out how you can make a feature film. Like we shot every, every scene that you see in the film every shot nothing is stock and he really honed his cinematography skills making that film like that was his goal like now he works as a cinematographer he's shooting with planet earth like he's like that's his thing and he learned that by doing it right by making films like this so yeah we did it for ourselves and then it ended up having a greater message as well that is so inspiring, especially in the fact that you can create a career from this and actually uh, change from your GIS position into doing something that, you know, contributes to education, especially on an issue that matters so much globally. Um, so I see that there's another question in chat. This is from John Newton. Did you ever drive at any colleges or universities? Pardon, did you ever dive into any colleges or universities and look into food waste within education? Uh, we didn't for the film, but since I have, because we've done lots of screenings with universities, um, and, and we often will go and like tour their cafeteria or see what the programs are that they're working on. I think more often than not, we get to see success stories because, you know, if they're willing to bring us out and show the film, then they want to like share the stuff that they're already working on. So I've seen some really great um organizations coming through starting with the food rescue network right because 
those are on campuses all across and it's a really great way for people to get involved, but also doing waste audits in the cafeterias, um, things like changing uh, the trays. Like, so there was a cafeteria, they took away they took away trays and all of a sudden they reduced their food waste because people can only carry so much. You can carry like one bowl and one plate. And so you take it and you eat it and then you realize you're full, you don't wanna go back. But if you have a tray, you fill up the whole freaking tray and then there was food waste. So I love those kind of psychological ways to reduce food waste. People don't feel like they're being put out, but um, it makes a big difference. And on campuses, it's such an interesting microcosm because People are there, they're eating on campus every day. You have a certain mass of people to work with. Um, but at the same time, everybody's busy and people aren't cooking from home. So they're eating out more often. Yeah, it's a really interesting dynamic. I love, I love institutions and schools because it's like this project that you can work on. I think that this kind of relates to what Delaney was saying at the, the flea market as well, where, um, you know, people think that if it's the last chart available, that there must be something wrong with it. It just goes to show that our perception of food is so warped. I think I literally think about that all the time. Like what he said there, where you're like, yeah. it needs to be like bursting out. And every time I'm <laughs> buying something, I'm like, I'm gonna buy the last one because I know it's okay, you know? Yeah, I think our eyes are master manipulators because there's nothing that really dictates that imperfections aesthetically dictate how food tastes or the quant the quality of that food, for example, correct? Yeah, but it, it's a sensory thing, right? Like you, you want it to be delicious. And I've had it, that myself, you know, when I prepare something for my family, say I'm making potatoes and like they've got a rotten part on it. So I'm cutting it off and they never know the difference. Sometimes I think that they enjoy the meal more than I do because in the back of my mind, I'm like thinking about that rotten part that I had to cut off, even though I know it's okay. <laughs> So, you know, when you're sheltered from the issues, you can enjoy it a little bit more. I think that's a, a great explanation of that. How do we encourage consumers to restrict impulse buying at the grocers? Um, I, like, I fall for this all the time as well, <laughs> um, especially with deals. I think if people are planning their grocery shops in advance, then they're less likely to kind of fall for that. Um, definitely if the grocery store has two for one items, it's because they're trying to push the product, but are they trying to push it because they have surplus in the system? Like maybe it's a good thing if you have room in your freezer and you can, you know, get two bags of peas, then get two bags of peas. But if you're overbuying and then it's going to go to waste at your house, it seems like a waste of money. And I think money is something that can motivate a lot of people. So a lot of campaigns around food waste are, are aimed at money. Um, and saving money in particular, the National Resources Defense Council did a huge ad campaign um, and food waste. And, and it was all about, you know, saving money, like be a good host, but try to save money as well. Kind of reminds me of that bread pop propaganda that we saw in the film. <laughs> mm -hmm. For sure. Was there a particular instance that inspired you to fight food waste? Uh, yeah, I, we were at a school and we were doing a waste audit. So we were like putting out their garbage can and like separating things into where they should go. And it was with just like one classroom. So, you know, you have like your paper on one side and your plastic. And then there was like good food in the garbage. Like I like bananas and juice boxes, like things that kids hadn't touched, but they'd just been throwing out. And I was just, I was so shocked because there's no way that I was ever allowed to do that in my house <laughs> growing up so we started just thinking you know if people if these kids are throwing out like edible food then who else is throwing out edible food and that was the the day that kind of sparked the idea that we should look into food waste more I'm glad you did what do you think is a major misconception about food waste uh you know we almost even shouldn't use the word food waste because, and I do it myself, but because then people think it's garbage and it's not, it's food surplus, right? Wow. Even the nonprofits that we filmed in the movie had a hard time getting behind the movie when I'm like, I'm doing a movie on food waste. And they're like, we don't want anything to do with food waste. Like, we're not about that. We're about food security. We're about feeding people with dignity. Like, we don't want garbage food associated with us in any way. And like, they were really 
worried about the way that we would spin it in the documentary, um, which is not, I mean, once you get to know us, you realize that we're not spinning anything. Um, so I, yeah, we shouldn't talk about it as food waste. We should talk about it as food surplus. It's extra food that's in the system. And we have two problems. One is we got to get the extra food to the people who need it because some people don't have enough. And then two, we have way too much food in the system. So then we have to start to change the system so that we don't have that excess. Like, yes, we need the 10% more, but we don't need the 30% more. Absolutely. Erin, our coordinator is saying um, she so agrees and that we hear the same thing from Mark from farmers that it is surplus and not food waste. So what, what, what might we do to decrease food food surplus how is there some is there anything we can do so um, many things there's so, so many, many things, things we can do yeah yeah i mean as individuals you know eating all the things we said at the end of the movie where you just like eat as much as you put on your plate and your meal planning um just buying as much as you need uh, a really strange one is trying to buy consistently uh, which is hard, but like if you think that you're a grocery store, you're trying to guess what people want um, based on, you know, previous patterns, but also on weird things like the weather. Like if it's a hot week in summer, people want watermelon, but if it's raining, they don't want it. But you need to order that, you know, weeks in advance. So how are you going to guess exactly what people want? So the more consistent we are, the, the easier it is for people to purchase. Um, I guess. And like one way of doing that is to buy directly from the farmer. So to buy something like a CSA box, if you can do that and you have it in your area, then you're saying, hey, I'm going to give you my 25 bucks a, a week and you're going to give me a box of whatever you got in your garden then. Um, that's one of the easiest ways to do it because then um, you're going to modify what you're eating based on what's actually available. I have another question about common misconceptions um, in regards to food surplus. So your mother-in-law was questioning whether you and Grant were starving. Um, do you think she didn't know to what extent that there is food surplus, particularly in dumpsters? Yeah, there's no way. Like the average person doesn't know. How would you ever know? You'd never, you'd never look in there. And one kind of regret that I have is that we didn't show more fresh produce. I think we we should have worked a little bit harder to go to the sources where he could really get um, fresh produce as well because we ate a lot of packaged food, but that's not indicative of the types of food that are just being wasted. That's just indicative of what was so easy for us to find that we just kept eating it. How do you think your perspective has changed since the film was made? Um, I... I'm more hopeful with more organizations coming to the front that are making a difference. Uh, in some ways, I'm a little more cynical because I see, I see the scale of the issue more clearly. Like when we went into it, I really had no idea at all. Um, and now, and now I kind of know the scale of the issue. But it's the people on the ground that I think are are making the difference. Like locally actually moving the food around actually feeding people it's really it's a really rewarding part um, and the same thing when you when you meet the people that are producing the food i mean i have lots of other environmental ideals around sustainability and the way that we should be eating and supporting local and uh, you know organic and and all of these things but when you meet the producers regardless of whether they are farming organically or not they are all working their ass off like they are all working as hard as they can they all value their jobs they're all trying to produce food for people and so that kind of shifted my perspective like i used to have this real hierarchy where i'm like oh organic farmers care more than other farmers but i don't think that's true at all i think there are just different systems for producing food um, and we can drive that as consumers by making choices and showing what we want farmers to do they want they want to get the food to us for sure. It sounds like misconceptions are a reoccurring theme in regarding this documentary as well as our our own understanding of food surplus and food waste. Yeah, we don't you don't know what you don't know. And meeting individuals always changes my perspective on things. It's so easy to say, oh, I don't like this group or this thing. 
But then when you meet the individuals that are involved in it, you're like, oh, they're actually great people. They're working really hard. And so then you have a new respect for that topic. It goes, goes for everything. <laughs> I thought it was particularly honorable. Um, the man who is responsible for feeding the pigs, um, it's not something you would expect that, I mean, I know that pigs pretty much eat anything, but I think that what he's doing, especially when he was offered millions of dollars for his property and his business is, is truly remarkable. So another question that I have personally is Celia produces great, great waste and so far as only the heart is accepted. I believe um, you had done an interview on this for your documentary, I can't recall um, the interviewee's name, but this is because they are forced to fit into these plastic bags. And I know you said yourself that you didn't want to purchase anything that was bagged prior to the documentary. And so if there was no need for bagged produce, do you think that that would greatly contribute and benefit producers and consumers alike, allowing us to have more produce in lieu of more plastic? Yeah, in some ways. I mean, I, I do understand how plastic does prolong the life of vegetables, et cetera. Um, but in so many cases, you know, if you're buying local, that you don't need them to last as long. So I think that's part of the problem. Um, but it's also changing the system. I mean, Tristan Stewart has a great story about beans where they had these runner, these long beans and they were chopping them off to fit them in the bag. Same thing. They were wasting like half the bean. And then the solution was to go to the suppliers and change the size of the bag. And then you fit the whole bean in. And it's like, it seems so simple, but like <laughs> his organization had to go go in and like make all those connections to like get everybody to agree like okay we'll use these bags now um but that's the solution you know so sometimes you have to change the system that's supporting the thing that's incorrect and it'll just rectify itself and then you can buy the, the produce in the bag i guess absolutely and more of it <laughs> so there's another question in the chat this is from jessica rolden you see Merced is at the heart of the Central Valley where food is harvested. How would you recommend reaching out to farmers to pick produce that will otherwise go waste? Um, I encourage to go through an organization just because they already have their relationships. Like farmers don't have a lot of time for people who are like, hey, can I come on your land and like, I'll bring some random people and you don't know who we are. Um, they really value relationships. So someone who's gonna, you know, be there every Sunday, bring a group of people make sure that everybody's being safe and sanitary like that's important to them as well and really being consistent so if you're ever working with an organization that's picking up food like don't flake out on them it's so important to like really show up when you say you're going to show up otherwise those people that have the food are going to be like screw it i'm not going to put in the time if people aren't going to show up so it's it's really important to be consistent and i know it's hard when people are volunteering um sometimes it's hard to wrangle like a group of people but yeah. yeah, if you're going as a group and have kind of, it gives you this extra legitimacy. Um, yeah. And they always let you take some home for yourself too. So there's always bonuses. That's why I like, love working in food because you always get something delicious out of it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, are there any more questions in the chat before we conclude and give the mic to Aaron? All right, well, that was fantastic. Um, there were so many points where I just wanna jump in and be like, yes, yes, yes. Especially that fantastic quote that you have. I'm gonna go jot that down and share it all over social media. Um, I don't remember exactly what it was because it just blew my mind. Um, and yes, it is not food waste, it is surplus food. And I need to like <laughs> catch myself every time I do it because I feel the same way. It's surplus for sure. Um, so, Thank you for talking about that too. I put several links in the chat. Um, specifically, if you're in the Merced area, there is a gleaning uh, group. It's through the food bank and I'm not entirely sure how active it is because of COVID. Um, that plays a big role, of course. So there's that. Um, and there's other ways if you're in Merced to get involved with food rescue as a part of my program and some others. So feel free and contact me if you need to. I can put my information in the chat, but also you already have my email probably because of the Zoom invite. So feel free and contact about that or any other resources. Uh, we love having these discussions. So if anyone has like another film in mind that would you know make for a good panel, whether it's around sustainable food or food waste in general, let me know. Um, and Jen, if you have any like recommendations for that, 
That would be oh yeah, I can send you some for sure. Awesome, thank you. This is so much fun. I like this part of my job a lot. <laughs> um, and with that, I don't have much more. Um, I noticed that Guillermo, my co-host and co-worker popped in. Um, I just thought I would let him say a couple words if he has any. Hey, Guillermo. Hi, everyone. It's uh, glad to see that we had such a great turnout. And Jen, thank you so much uh, for participating. The discussion was riveting, and I'm sure everyone here agreed. I'm Guillermo Ortiz. I'm the Sustainability and Diversity Educational Programs Manager at UC Merced in the Office of Sustainability. Uh, we're glad that we could have this discussion and really learn about this important topic of, and now I'm going to have to change uh, my vocabulary, right? Food surplus, uh, and really start going into it. But thank you so much. Uh, for creating the film, for putting that knowledge out into the world and in challenging us to, to look at our behaviors in a different way. So, Jen, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Awesome. And um, there is a note also in the chat. Did you address writing letters to Safeway and others to ask them to reduce uh, food waste? Um, I think, Harry, maybe you joined us a little bit late, but we did address that question at the very beginning, and there will be a recording to this, um, but if you want to, again, elaborate, Jen, on that question regarding, like, templates um, and regarding how that church or churches can get involved with, like, corporations. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry I missed the beginning of the discussion. Well, thanks for addressing it. Yeah, I can see the recording if we're out of time, but... Um, <clears throat> Yeah, a church group I'm in would uh, be ready, willing, and able to write letters to um, to different corporations in the the food chain or the food waste chain, um, asking them to to reduce waste. Uh, we've written letters asking people to reduce plastic packaging. So, um, yeah, uh, I'll I'll uh, I'll watch the recording. I'll listen to the beginning of it, and I'll hear the answer to that. Thanks. And one other thing I wanted to note, um, there is a new initiative, well, it's relatively new, but it's um, taking off a little bit, and it's called the um, U.S. Food Loss and Waste 2030 Champions, and basically there's this initiative to get corporations to sign up for reducing their food waste. And so I actually got an interesting email today with the headline of Trump administration welcomes Amazon to the U.S. Food Loss and Waste 2030 Champions. So Amazon was added to this list and the list includes um, places like Blue Apron, Bon Petit, General Mills, HelloFresh, um, Kroger, uh, Unilever, Walmart, Walt Disney World, Legman's, uh, Yum Brands. So there are some initiatives going on to help reduce food waste at the corporation and the uh, higher levels. So that is fantastic news. Um, getting Amazon on board, that's a good direction for sure so yeah could, could you uh, say that name again please the something 2020 yeah um it is the u.s food loss and food waste 2030 champions i will put that in chat okay thank you of course. one of the things you could uh include in your letters which i didn't mention was um pressuring grocery stores to make their their waste statistics public. So there was a grocery store in, I think in the UK, and I believe it was Tesco, but I can't remember, um, that said they were gonna, they're gonna do their waste audit and then they're gonna publish their numbers so that people actually see how they're doing. And I think that kind of public accountability would be amazing. Um, and that only comes from public pressure. Yeah, I agree, that's a fantastic idea. All right, well, um, this recording will be up soon on YouTube and some other places. I'll send it out via uh, email to everyone that attended. Thank you so much for joining. Alicia, thank you for hosting. Jen, thank you so much for all your wisdom, for making the film uh, inspiring so many. Thank and you. have a very, very happy World Food Day. Thank, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks everyone, bye.